Coming up on DTNS, do we need augmented reality with our television shows? Phone form factors keep trying to impress us, but do they? And why it actually makes sense for Microsoft to acquire TikTok. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, August 26th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And triumphantly back at Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lean. Hey. Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, we just uncovered the secret history of Captain Crunch. If you want that and more, <laughs> uh, you got to become a member. Patreon.com slash DTNS and get the full show. Good day, Internet. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Xiaomi reported its profit more than doubled in Q2, and overseas sales have returned to pre-pandemic levels. Revenue rose 3.1% in the quarter ending June 30th, while sales rose to 53.54 billion won, or 7.77 billion U.S. dollars. Smartphone revenue fell 1.2% overall, but sales of premium phones overseas rose 99.2% on the year. Xiaomi is relying more on overseas sales as in India as it's... Uh, as it fights Huawei for sales in China to find out who's number one. Microsoft announced general availability of immersive reader from Azure Cognitive Services, which lets developers embed text reading and comprehension capabilities into apps. Immersive reader is designed to help users with dyslexia, dis, uh, dis I can never say this right. Dysgraphia. Dysgraphia, is that how you say it? All right. And ADHD. It has features like reading text aloud while highlighting words, optimized font spacing, and syllable breaks. Very cool. Google released Chrome 85 with 10% faster page loads thanks to Profile Guided Optimization, or PGO. PGO lets the most performance critical parts of code run faster. Google says this should be especially helpful when you have many tabs open or multiple programs running. You can also now collapse and expand tab groups to save some space in your tab strip, and Chrome 85 will block you from downloading EXEs and APKs over HTTP if the page itself Itself is secured with HTTPS. Progressive web apps can also now create app shortcuts on Chrome and Windows. In Apple's upcoming iOS 14, apps will need to ask permission of users before they can collect the Apple Device Identifier, or IDFA. This is how many ad networks, including the Facebook Audience Network, tracks users to target ads. Facebook sent a warning to developers that use the Facebook Audience Network for ad revenue, saying revenue could drop by 50% or more, and may no longer make sense for Facebook to offer the audience network for iOS 14. We'll try to needle Apple developers while they're mad at Apple for other reasons. That's yeah. interesting. Poking a poking the mad horse. DJI announced the new OM4 camera stabilization product. OM4 now features a magnetic attachment system, an adhesive or side-on, excuse me, slide-on accessory attaches to the phone to enable a magnetic attachment. The gimbal has multiple upgraded shooting modes, and a upgrade to the active track to better distinguish between subjects, including people and their pets. Gesture control comes from DJI's drones as well. The OM4 is available now for $150 US. And Android Authority published a video of LG's forthcoming phone, the Wing. The Wing is a dual screen phone with each screen on top of the other, so the top one can rotate open into a T shape. And yes, LG had a feature phone that did this like back in the early to mid 2000s. In the uh, video that Android Authority published, the lower screen can show controls like a keyboard, while the main phone in the horizontal mode shows your main thing like your browser or your map. LG has yet to confirm the device. Well, speaking of phones that, uh, I don't know, we're getting creative here, Asus's Zenfone 7 and 7 Pro feature a more durable version of its rotating rear camera that can flip over to take selfies, but now also includes an extra zoom lens as well as an OLED display and a 90 uh, hertz refresh rate. It still has the 5,000 milliamp battery. Uh, which is very good. The phone is on sale in Taiwan with the Zen Phone 7 at 21,990 new Taiwanese dollars, which is around 749 US dollars, and the Zen Phone 7 Pro at 27,990 new Taiwanese dollars, which is around US $953. The phones will come to select European markets September 1st with pricing yet to be announced. I, okay, so the Zenfone feature isn't new, but they said they made it like twice as durable. 
Uh, so instead of 100,000 flips of the camera, it's 200,000. But that idea that I would get the same camera, selfie or front facing, uh, or rear facing, I guess, uh, is, is cool. I like that. Yeah. It, more moving parts makes me nervous, you know, but I, I do like the idea that, oh, I don't have to have a notch. I don't have to compromise on my selfie camera being any different than my other camera. Uh, it didn't really like light the world on fire with the Zenfone 6. Uh, so maybe, I, you know, a little OLED and 90 hertz refresh rate probably isn't going to change that. But maybe the more durability will. I don't know. This is a good phone. It's well reviewed. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I think the folks who were sort of like, well, you want a rear and a front facing. I mean, what really ever took advantage of that besides a couple of apps that, you know, were able to, you know, take a photo, you know, front and back at the same time or video kind of thing. A fun novelty, but most people don't use a phone that way. So to have a single camera that works in the array that you wanted to, that is, you know, of high quality, that does make a lot of sense as long I, as it doesn't, you know, you know, pinch off in your pocket. Yeah, I agree. I also, I mean, this is a side note, but I don't like it when these guys tell me how many times I can do a thing or how many charges I can charge a thing, even though it's astronomical numbers, 200,000 times, a lot of times. I hate knowing there's a finite number or a close to finite number. Don't tell him the odds. I really don't. I hate it. I would much <laughs> rather believe it. Just make me believe it will forever. It'll last know, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I don't have to think about it anymore because then I'll just think of that number. Did I do that five times today? Oh, crap. I wonder what that does to my total. It's just my brain. I'll admit it, but I don't like it. Well, I, I, I don't lost think you're alone the, there. Yeah. No, no, I don't think he's alone either. Yeah. Yeah, well, I lost a little of the thread of my thought there because I meant to say I really like the Zen phone flip over camera thing as an idea. The LG wing, on the other hand, <laughs> I, not so much. Okay. I got nothing. I don't I know. I mean, l listen, the 10 second video that I saw um, of it being, uh, you know, uh, um, in a car, I was like, well, that's kind of nice. <laughs> if you don't have a car that has kind of a, you know, in screen display that would do a lot of that stuff already. And a lot of cars don't yet. So, mm. sure. But uh, yeah, it it is. It is a rotating nightmare to me. Mm. Just put your regular phone in landscape mode in your car. Like, I'm, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, well, right. Time, time will tell if anyone wants that thing. Uh, the web version of Microsoft Word for Microsoft 365 subscribers is getting a record and transcription feature at no additional charge. New features are always nice. Users can either record audio or upload an audio file and then have it transcribed. Live audio will be transcribed within moments, while uploads may take a little bit longer depending on the length of that recording. Users can transcribe unlimited live audio and five hours a month of uploaded audio files. Microsoft plans to expand the feature to phones and tablets, but has not mentioned plans to add it to any desktop version of Word. But, yeah, it uh, takes as long as the length of the recording. So if you'd upload a five-minute recording, it's, it's basically going to play it. So it's going to take five minutes. Whereas if you're talking, it can, it can transcribe on the fly. Uh, and this is nifty. I mean, granted, you're not really getting it for free because you have to pay for Microsoft 365. But if you're already paying for Microsoft 365, which most Word users at this point probably are, uh, then you've got a, a cool new feature that that you can add to your web version. Uh, and and it's not as feature rich as, say, an auto AI or, or something dedicated to this. But in the context of, oh, now it's built into Word and I can, you know, take some quick notes or something, I think it's handy. It's also, it's the kind of feature that I immediately picture a business guy running through the airport, sitting down, having a little time between flights and saying stuff into his phone that he will transcribe and send off to his secretary while he's flying to, you know, Ohio for the next convention or something, which isn't happening a lot right now. But you and know what I mean? Like, for some unfortunate reason, that put the uh, O.J. Simpson Hertz commercial in mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. What have oh, I done? Oh, well, uh, all right. <laughs> I uh, probably shouldn't have even brought it up. I apologize. <laughs> uh, Chromium is the code underlying most browsers, uh, Google's Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Opera, and more. And Chromium has a feature called the Intranet Redirect Detector. It checks to see if an ISP is using non-existent domain results to deliver pages with ads. Now, they're not just doing this because you don't like those pages with ads. This is to prevent unnecessary drop-down choices in the address bar when your company intranet has a site and your ISP is pretending like that's also a site on the web. Because the way the address bar works is like, oh, there's a legitimate site out there called marketing.com. And you are also have an intranet site in your business called marketing. Which one do you want, right? So there might be stuff like, you know, human resources dev 
And if your ISP is like, we're any any domain name that doesn't exist, we're going to deliver a page with ads for, then everything you put for your intranet would give you that drop down, which would be an extra click. So that's what this feature is for to say like, oh, wait a minute, if we realize that those are fake websites and it's just a page of ads, we're not going to give you the drop down. We'll just take you straight to your intranet site. That's cool, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. To make that happen, Chromium has to try three unregistered domains to see if it gets a page or not. And then it'll know, oh, okay, we have, to, we have to adapt to that. However, for ISPs that are not hijacking unregistered domains, it's trying those three domains and having to go all the way through the domain name system, the DNS, which we talked about on Know A Little More uh, last week, uh, to the root server, because there won't be a locally cached record of the domain because it doesn't exist. Uh, that means that the top level root servers are getting crushed with Chromium traffic from people using Chromium that don't even know this feature exists, that aren't on an intranet. Ars Technica mm -hmm. notes that VeriSign statistics indicate this adds half the total load on root servers. An open bug in the Chromium project requests making the intranet redirect detector be off by default. That way, if your ISP doesn't deliver these fake uh, pages with ads, or if you're not somebody using an intranet, you don't send a bunch of traffic to the root domain name servers. I, mean, I don't have a ton of questions other than I think you did a really good job of explaining that. And that's a boring topic. I don't mean to, <laughs> it's a great topic for the show. I've said this before the show and I'll say it now. Great topic, perfect for tech news. But so Tom has a way of taking the mundane of the daily tech news and making it interesting. So I well, just want to and, say- And uh, also yeah. the takeaway is like, this should be off by default to, you yes. know, to cut down on everyone being like, what is happening right now? You know, with this browser that's supposed to be really great. So there you go. Yep. Uh, Bloomberg sources say Apple plans to add augmented reality content to a, uh, to its, or sorry, as a companion to its Apple TV plus TV shows. So some of that programming over there, characters or objects uh, from the shows would be overlaid on the real world as seen through your phone. Uh, as an example, a viewer for all mankind could see a lunar rover on their coffee table, that sort of thing, uh, when they're looking through their phone or their iPad. We were talking before the show, this is very likely precursor stuff to maybe a future headset that's been rumored forever anyway. And that's maybe the more interesting implementation yeah. than your phone in a room somewhere. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, <clears throat> I hate to be, you know, be like, oh, this sounds stupid. And and I love VR. Like, I'm a VR enthusiast. AR, almost like I need more, I don't know, I, I, I need it to be proven a little bit more to me. I'm sort of like, okay, well, I watch a lot of content on my Apple TV. You know, I, I'm in the Apple ecosystem in many ways. Uh, I sometimes airplay things from my phone to my uh, Apple TV again, you know, that kind of thing. So AR, like, what am I getting exactly? Like, information about the actors who might be in a particular show that I'm watching. Oh, yeah. It could be delivered nicely, but it could be just like one of these things where it's like, we did it because we could. And everyone's like, no one asked for this. I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, and that, that's the thing. This is... Bloomberg and uh, Mark Gurman, who has good sources uh, yes, saying this, it's not there yet. So we don't know what they have. Apple's usually pretty good about not launching a feature unless there's a, a at least a story they can tell about why you would want it. Right. Uh, so launching this before there's a headset, I'm very curious to see what they're going to say. Like, oh, you could you could see the director's commentary, and through your phone, you'll see the director standing there talking to you. Or, or maybe there is additional content to the plot that happens off your television screen and in your room. That might be fun. All of those things feel like going back to what you said, Scott. Feel better if you actually had a headset on rather than having to hold up your phone or your iPad. Yeah, there there is one case uh, where, and I was thinking about this before the show, and I've it's it's formulated a little better in my mind how I could envision it. But let's say you're watching something that's very special effects oriented and on screen is some sort of huge monstrous creature that's clearly been built out of CGI or something to be able to pause the movie because you'd want to do that. That's the other thing is you don't want to miss the movie or the TV show you're watching. Right, right. And then look at my table and see a fully oh, formed 3D yeah. model of that object and then I can kind of look around it and 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 then if I go around the back, I see the back's missing and there's text there that says, since the back of the monster was never shown, it was never uh -huh. actually it was but never I, rendered. 
Then it gets interesting. Then I'm like, ooh, d info I never would have heard otherwise that, yeah, I could get in some extra features documentary style or something. But I don't know. that Some of that stuff appeals to me. The AR is good enough on phones that you'd get the kind of fidelity and quality, quality that you're looking for. But ultimately, it still feels like a precursor to I want this on my head and I want it to be small and I want it to be unobtrusive and just kind of a natural flow while I'm watching things. And maybe that's what Oh, uh, I think I figured it out. I think I cracked it. Mm. Clothing and furniture. When you're watching For All Mankind set in the, <laughs> the 60s and you're like, man, that's a cool retro coffee table. <laughs> I love, uh, what I love would that it look like in my house? Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you just I, told them how to monetize it. That's not, we, we just give them more reason to make money. Yeah, well, now Apple will know. Why do they said. ever come out with any technology? Right? But also, yeah. you know, for anybody who's sort of like, but why would they come up with a technology a, a year plus ahead of, a, you know, an AR headset? Let's say that's happening, yeah, right? Yeah, right. I mean, it's a little bit like uh, before the Apple Watch. There were a lot of things that a phone could do. And people kind of got used to that, but it was maybe uh -huh. a little bit cumbersome. And then it was like, now we have this new gadget that makes all the things that you want to do better, better. Yeah. So I think there's, you know, you there's... build up the appetite for it. That's exactly. Point. Well, um, did anyone remember Fortnite <laughs> in this show to date? Never yeah, heard well, yeah, I know. The new season of Fortnite still exists, everybody. Arrives on August 27th, uh, highly anticipated. But because Apple is blocking Fortnite from the App Store, the new season can't be added to existing iOS versions of the game. And Epic seems to have decided not to update macOS versions either. As a result, Epic will no longer let folks, <clears throat> pardon me, playing on iOS or macOS crossplay with other versions of Fortnite. They'll be able to con uh, continue to play against each other, but again, cross-platform gets weird. Yeah, so fracturing of the worlds. You can, if you're in the Apple ecosystem, you can play with each other on the old season. If you're not, you can play with each other across all the other platforms, Windows, Xbox, et cetera, Android. Um, I, I'm sure there might be a reason where Epic said, look, we could put this in the macOS version because technically we don't go through the App Store, but that legally might be fraught with peril because it would, you know, uh, put us in danger of a developer agreement and it's already dangerous enough. I do think it it feels like they're they're just saying like, well, you know, if Apple's going to be like this about the way we're being, uh, then we're just not going to let anybody get the new season on, on anything. Um, but that said, given that I mean, Epic could change this anytime they want. They could take away the alternate payment system from Fortnite and Apple will unblock it. So you can decide who you want to blame. But given that Fortnite isn't uh, available to be updated for the new season through the Apple App Store, cutting it off from the rest of the platform seems like the only choice. You don't want to have people wandering into each other in two different seasons. The messed up thing about this in my mind is that on the PC side, well, actually in the in the cross-platform uh, ability of the of the game since its inception that was one of their big spearheaded ideas they were like good look we're gonna we're gonna get away from this idea of these walled separate gardens everybody in ps4 is playing ps4 people everybody on pc is playing pc we're gonna make it work with everybody and a lot of people didn't believe it would work but it did you had phone people playing with pc people and and, and everything else in between this feels like going back on their own you know big idea that everything should be in one big pile one server to serve them all sort of idea and instead They've had to, I mean, this means they've literally had to set up virtual servers or actual servers to run older versions of the of the build in in the meantime. And that's just, it's weird compared to what their plans were. Yeah, which means they are at least trying to support the players on yeah. Apple who who still have the app on their phones and and not they could have just said, Well, you're you're out of luck. Complain yeah. to Apple, right? So they they did go that far. Uh, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Andrew Ross Sorkin and Mike Isaac from the New York Times published an in-depth look at how Microsoft got pulled into possibly buying part or all of TikTok. Uh, it's been going on longer than you think, according to their sources, and they have like a dozen more sources. The U.S. Committee on Foreign Investment began an investigation into ByteDance in November. We talked about this last November on DTNS. What we didn't know is that ByteDance investors Sequoia and General Atlantic began acting then as go-betweens with ByteDance, the company they're investing in, and the U.S. administration. What they 
determined was the U.S. said it wanted ByteDance to reduce its ownership in TikTok, restructure corporate governance, that's something the U.S. successfully got ZTE to do, and move all the U.S. data to U.S.-based servers. Remember, TikTok says that all the data is on U.S. servers, but it's also backed up in Singapore. They're like, nope, no more Singapore, all of it on in U.S. So ByteDance turned to Microsoft as a U.S. partner, not under antitrust scrutiny, that could help them meet those conditions. Plus, ByteDance CEO Zhang Yiming is a former Microsoft engineer. Talks with Microsoft began in July, so before all this stuff broke, and in part began, and in part because of US-China tensions, Microsoft and ByteDance were talking about Microsoft taking a minority investment. They're like, an acquisition would probably uh, not fly. It would be, it'd bring too much attention. Microsoft really just hoped to get TikTok off Google Cloud and onto Azure, as I've been saying. This would fulfill the US conditions. They, ByteDance would be reducing their investment. They could probably do the government restructure without Microsoft, but then they Microsoft would help them move all the data into the US. Reduced ownership by ByteDance and US data on US Azure servers would be the thing that would be a win-win for ByteDance and Microsoft. So it looked like everything was just a matter of dot and I's and cross and T's. But as talks went on, Microsoft realized the advantage of owning TikTok and especially TikTok data. That TikTok data would be especially beneficial for Microsoft's data science arm in training machine learning, as well as a benefit to Microsoft's advertising business. Don't forget, they sell ads on MSN and Bing and other things. They make about $7 million off of advertising. So the two companies started to see an acquisition as maybe a cleaner option after all. In that scenario, Microsoft would let TikTok run as a standalone unit, similar to how LinkedIn and Mojang, Mojang, which makes micro Minecraft, run right now under Microsoft. They would just buy TikTok and let it do its thing. On July 31st, the Committee on Foreign Investment Analysis was done, and the recommendation at that time was that ByteDance be ordered to sell TikTok to a U.S. owner, and they had one ready, Microsoft, Chinese shareholders would only be allowed to keep a minority investment, and that's what ByteDance wanted. They're like, we'll sell it to TikTok, we'll just keep a small cut of it. And this seemed to fit into the Microsoft ByteDance plans perfectly. However, the president and many of his advisors wanted to go farther and instead decided to ban TikTok entirely. The president called Satya Nadella, gave him 45 days to complete a deal, which has now been extended, but at the time, that's what happened, adding that ByteDance should retain no ownership now, and the deal should benefit the government some way, such as job creation or other economic benefits, if not a payment into the treasury somehow. Now, this article also says Oracle is now interested, uh, that many bankers and investors have tried to get Twitter and Netflix involved. So if you've heard Twitter's name, that might be why. It may not be that Twitter's interested. It's that people are trying to get them interested. But Microsoft, Microsoft is still the furthest along in these acquisitions. Or these talks. I read this Times article, and the part that um, that really was educational for me was um, I've been trying to figure out since the lawsuit was filed against the administration um, what the motivation was. Is that standard? Is that TikTok's way of going? Ah, we got to fight it somehow. Or you know, I did, I just didn't know. I don't follow this stuff. I know to know for sure. But in that article, it made it pretty clear that 45 days is not a lot of time to do anything uh, in in regards to the transference of ownership of gigantic and it's since properties. been extended to 90 days which still isn't a lot of still time. not a lot of time like even in the tiny companies i've worked for before the time frames are either needed to be fluid or if there was a deadline sometimes it meant we were going to kill ourselves to get there and and i and i can't imagine even in 90 days how this is going to go at all smoothly so my biggest takeaway from all of this is i think there's a solution someone's going to this is, in the, this is going to end up happening, and Microsoft's probably going to be where it ends up. All of that stuff that everybody's predicting is probably true. I just don't think they've given it enough time to do it. And maybe they can still extend that. Maybe this lawsuit is a way of, well, the article argues that that may be a, a stall tactic, and it may be yeah. the only one they have. So if it is, then then great. But I just think they need time. And I don't mean just TikTok. I mean, Microsoft needs time. And, and they, They've had more time than I thought they had since this started in right, July. Right. That's well, still that's not true. a lot extra, though. And yeah, if they can get a temporary restraining order on the executive order while they litigate it, uh, that's all they need. They just need to say, hey, you can't enforce that executive order until we've finished our court case, even if they lose the court case and the executive order goes into effect. 
Right. I mean, it, clearly the situation is fluid, and who knows at this point? I mean, it changes by the day, but it does kind of bring me back to when Microsoft was first floated as made by TikTok. I mean, a lot of us were like, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> when did this happen? And it turns out, you know, there's more to the story, which often happens with acquisitions that seem a little, you know, out of the blue. So, the, you know, there's, there's, there's more to it. Yeah, and it yeah. talks gets in deeper into how Microsoft's got a lot of stuff into their in their arsenal, um, including the money to do it and also the lack of scrutiny in terms of, you know, uh, anti-competitiveness and all that stuff right now. But they also lack severely in the social data department. And so I think that's an important key thing here is that Microsoft, one of their things Microsoft really wants out of the deal, if they get the deal or what they would want, is all this social data that they can then use to build stuff. And yeah. that's what everybody wants right now. And, and what honestly, what they want most is somebody paying for Azure or being able to show off Azure running a service as big as TikTok, right? That's yeah. number one, whether they keep it or not. Then the fact that they have a model with LinkedIn and Minecraft, okay, so we know how they might run it, just let it go. You know, they they wouldn't mess with it. That seems to have worked very well for both of those units. Uh, and then they could spin it off if they want, keep it as an Azure client. But I hadn't thought about the data science stuff, and I, ha I definitely hadn't thought about the advertising aspect of it. That could be a huge boon for Microsoft's advertising service, which isn't small, but it's not on the level of Google and Facebook. Yeah, and in 90 days, if they can pull it off, it suddenly becomes very big. So. Yeah. Well, if you have thoughts on this or anything else, you can join a conversation in our Discord going on right now, 24-7, in fact. And you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. Chris wrote in and said, I want to thank DTNS for not calling services apps. This is something that, you know, gets Chris's goat. He, he says, I occasionally hear a slip up, but other prominent publications call the many services we use apps. The Zoom app, the TikTok app. It greatly confuses users into thinking that the square on their phone contains the totality of what is encompassed in an extensive complex services available in many sovereign territories. The app economy died with the $3 flashlight app. <laughs> Remember that one? It is reminiscent of the late 1990s when people would refer to services like eBay as web pages. Chris says, I think it would be a great, no, a little more segment to help people understand a little bit more about the app on their phone being just a view, like logging into a website, into a service that has many complexities. Yeah, I mean, I try to only talk about it as an app when we're talking about it as an app. Like when we're talking about, sure. oh, they would put the app on the store, that sort of thing. Uh, so Chris, I'm, I'm with you there. It, it is more than a service. And it reminded me of explaining uh, the web to Sherry Tornatori at Half Price Books in 1997. And she was like, so where is this website? And I'm like, it's out there. Like she was so used to installed software that, mm. that it was a it had to it was a change in perception to be like, what do you, what do you mean out there, out where? Uh, so, so yeah, this is a fun one to apply to the to the whole Fortnite mess because if you think about it, it applies yeah. there too. Not just it's just not a not a game or an app on your phone. It's a service that that is, that game is a window to. And yeah. It's the same thing. So yeah. the app is blocked, but the service still exists out there. Right. You just can't get to it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and also, Big Jim writes regarding companies moving their electronics factories to Mexico. Uh, Jim says it's actually nothing new that companies are looking to do what we call short shipping. But honestly, it has little to do with the free trade agreement and more to do with lead times, accountability, and inventory reduction. China and Asia are still much cheaper to produce in, and even with the Section 301 tariffs, many suppliers to companies are simply eating the difference with the long-term goal of stabilizing the market and writing things out. What most U.S. companies are having issues with are the delays in the logistics area and the increased costs that affect their while-just-in-time models. I expect to actually see more development in South America because of this and less U.S. development in Africa in the medium term. So so Jim is saying, look, it's it's more about logistics. It's more about getting that stuff here fast. And when, when you're, you know, in short shipping, uh, that means you get stuff here faster. Thank you, Jim. He also pointed us to a story from Freight Waves that shows U.S. imports from China are booming even during the trade war. And the lockdown, because people are spending less money on services like travel and eating out and more money on stuff like furniture for your home office or home improvement. Interesting. Yeah. Well, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Rick Hubner, Martin James, 
and Deracia A. Daniels. Also, thanks to the one, the only Scott Johnson. Scott, <laughs> you're a busy man. What have you been up to? Well, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's brand new comics up and podcasts and all sorts of things. But I want to mention that Tom and I have been working very dil diligently with a couple of producers on Current Geek Chronicles, which successfully funded last month, which means we are about to launch our second episode. First one was put out to sort of get people excited during the Kickstarter. Second episode all about, I don't know, beginner's guide to why wrestling is such a freak out sport for so many people and why some of us don't understand. If that sounds at all interesting to you, and I promise you it is, uh, go check it out. It'll be up there on the first and every week thereafter until the season is done. So check it out. Currentgeek.com is where to go. Subscribe to the feed. It's uh, already on your phone for a lot of you. Don't even have to worry about it. But if you haven't subscribed, get it wherever you get your podcasts. That's at currentgeek.com, frogpants.com for everything else you're looking for. There's also a history of Zoom and Enhance coming and mm. an episode called From Scuzzy to USB. So <laughs> I don't know. You, you want to get in now and get these episodes, currentgeek.com. Uh, you can also support this show at any level and get a bunch of perks. Uh, Scott's going to be doing a live with it on the Magic Keyboard. Uh, and if you want to get his thoughts on, on living three months with the Magic Keyboard, uh, become a Patreon. You'll get it before everybody else. Patreon.com slash DTNS. If you have feedback for us, we would love to hear it. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And if you can join us live, we'd love that too. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. And find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Justin Robert Young's in tomorrow. I'll talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>